the 16th chapter then. Excuse me, 15th chapter. I just thought I'd move us along even quicker. 15th chapter of John. We're in part 3 tonight of a fruitless Christianity is a rootless Christianity. Coming right off of Jesus' statements concerning the very familiar passage of the vine and the branches, starting in verse 1 of chapter 15. Now remember our context here, Jesus and, uh, and the 11 now, because Jesus is gone. It's Passover night. It is the night that he is going to go to Gethsemane, and then the rabble that Judas is going to bring um, is going to show up later uh, this night and is uh, going to, on the trumped-up charges, the lies, is going to arrest Christ, bring him first to Annas, then to Caiaphas. False, false witnesses, contradictory witnesses will be raised up. But Christ Jesus is in control of the entire matter. That's what this is about. He's in control from one end to the other. But before we get to that, there's the matter of Jesus taking the boys by the hand as they're moving out of the upper room. They're moving along now, and they're heading towards Gethsemane. Um, there's going to be a time of prayer that Jesus is going to enter into in the 17th chapter of John. I mean, isn't this great? I mean, you stop and think about uh, he knows that he's going to be taken. He's going to be arrested. Put yourself in his shoes if you possibly can for a moment. You know later tonight there's going to be a knock on the door, and they're going to take you, bind you. They're going to throw you in a dungeon, essentially. You're going to be whipped. You're going to have a crown of thorns put on your head. You're going to be tortured. There's going to be false witnesses saying lies about you. You're going to be taken. You're going to be whipped within an inch of your life. And, of course, many of these men, the Roman whipping situation, the torture situation, was, was there to elicit information. And most of the time, even the threat of going through a Roman torture whipping like this in regards to the nature of what it was uh, and often would kill people, even the threat of it would be enough to stop uh, people dead in their tracks and they'll just start telling, you know, come forth with all the information, whatever it is you need to know. I mean, even to the point of, I'll lie, I'll say whatever you want, kind of a thing. But you know this is coming. And then at the end of all of that, not release, not the emergency room, not help, not comfort, now we're going to go to a cross. And six hours he's going to be on that cross. Six hours. And now here's, here's the catch. And this is what none of us can relate to. He's going to become sin in its very essence, substitutionally, substitutionally. It's, it's, the, it's the moment of history, the cross, ladies and gentlemen, the cross that Jesus is preparing the boys for right now, that they are heading towards. The cross is the key pivotal moment in all human history. No cross. I've said this to you before. There would be no further history. Life would have ended right there. Life would have stopped. Because that means God would have to uh, kill everybody. Everybody would die. Everybody would be tormented in the agonies of hell forever if it wasn't for the cross. And so that's the reason for the, the cross, that moment in history. It's uh, the, the resurrection attests to the finished work of Christ and seals our justification by faith, according to Romans 4.25. But it's the cross that is the center moment in all of this. Before this is going to happen, it can, see, see, none of us can imagine this, can we? None of us can. But before any of this is happening, he, has been, he is going to, as he's going through chapter 14, 15, and 16, sandwiched it in there, which we've already done now, talking to them about the baptism, his baptism with the Holy Spirit, feeding that to them, you see. But there's more information he's giving them. Nobody's got a tape recorder. The Holy Spirit has to bring all this back later. As John is writing this, it's, he's experiencing exactly what Jesus said would happen, that, that the Holy Spirit would bring back to your minds all that I have said unto you. He will show you things to come. So prophetic scripture, book of Revelation, other things like that. Now, John is experiencing that moment. It's just all coming back to him. See? In the meantime, Jesus wants to talk about something that's critical. After I have done all of this and I've made provision, propitiation, and I have saved whom I will save, that there is an expectation of fruitfulness because the cross is the entree to transformation. We're being conformed. That means us, us and our old stuff has to go away. That's why he removes the sin nature from us. The body of sin 
has been rendered deactivated, it says in Romans 6.6. 6. So he removes all of this so that we can move forward. So it's an expected thing. And we're going to see a little bit more of that as we move through the first part of it. And then we started moving through, you know, the second part, which we started last week. In verse 6, we talked about the consequence of a fruitless Christianity. Look at verse 6. I won't, I won't back up to verse 1. You're already there with all that. Verse 6, he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. He talks about the responsibility and the expectation of abiding in him, living in him. Remember, meno, the Greek word for abide, is just like living in your house or living in your clothes or living in your job. You know, we need all those things. Living in, if you didn't have a house, can you imagine what it was like be outside in this kind of weather right now? Let's say you had no house. Nowhere to go. And there, of course, are people out there for various reasons that are experiencing that right now. Horrible, terrible, abiding. So we have this, this building to abide in, to meet in. The heat works. Remember when it didn't work once or twice? How horrible that was? Yeah. Abiding. Jesus says, if anyone does not abide in me, which is expected, then he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. Now, remember, I talked to you about this. This is not Jesus taking the soul of this person and then casting them away from him, throwing them into hell. If you don't abide in me, then you go to hell. Well, that means that abiding in him is now a requirement in order for me to either be saved or keep my salvation. Well, that's a works righteousness. There's no way around it. You cannot be dependent upon, I cannot be dependent upon to stay saved. If Jesus is depending upon me, and what I do and what I believe to be saved, I'm through. I'm toast. I'm done. It can't be. We're too weak. As long as we're in this flesh, it, it won't happen. It absolutely won't happen. It's not possible. It can't be done. Nobody can do it. You know why? Because Romans 3, verses 10 through 12 says there is none good. No, not one. Not even one. Just in case you are tempted to think that somebody could be good enough to get saved on their own, to stay saved, to keep themselves saved. I just want you to know there is none good, not even one. That means not even you, not even me. There is none who are righteous. Well, without Christ's imputed righteousness, there is no salvation. There cannot be. There is no ongoing salvation. There is no continuation of the confirmation of peace and assurance. It does not exist. It is only to be found in the finished work of Christ. And then he tells us, now that I have finished this work, you can abide in me. He's going to talk about that, what abiding in him is tonight. But in the meantime, he wants us to understand that just like there is in a vineyard, when a branch is separated itself, or excuse me, a vine has separated, uh, I got it right the first time. When a vine has separated itself or been removed from the main vine, then it's all dried up. There's nothing you can do for them. So what do they do? Well, the guys, they, they gather them all up and they, they get rid of them. You know What he's saying here is it's thrown away as a branch and dries up. They gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. But you see, he's talking about his own kids right here. And he's already said in John 6, 37, what? Yeah. He who comes to me, I will never cast out. Never cast out. But I will raise them up on the last day. I will raise them up on the last day, he says it three different times. So that's not what this is talking about. But what this is talking about is he casts us just like a, a, a farmer's field or a vineyard that's been overrun with uh, thorns and thistles and weeds. That, that that field in particular will go through a burning process. And we saw that last week in Hebrews 6, verses 11 through 12. Or rather, 1 through 12, excuse me, Hebrews 6, 1 through 12. And as a result of that discipline of having the field of your life burned down, all of that good carbon then is just mowed right back into the earth. And then the seed goes in, right? The seed of the word goes in and fruitfulness starts all over again. Because God knows what's in the way of, that's keeping us from abiding in him and from bearing fruit. Part of being saved is the onus and the absolutes of being a fruit bearer. He knows exactly what to put his finger on and what to remove in our lives in order for us to bear fruit. And we keep coming back, you know, to verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. The Greek word there being elego for elect. You did not elect me, but I elect you and appoint you that you would go and what? Bear fruit. 
So you have an appointment, it says, to bear fruit and the kind of fruit that would remain. And of course, that's directly tied in here with asking and receiving in prayer at the bottom of verse 16. So he continues in that. We get over to verse 7 after we've seen the consequence of a fruitless Christianity. Verse 6 is you get yourself burned <laughs> so that you might be a new field and that you might bear fruit. Moves us into verse 7 which is the condition we saw of a confident Christianity. Well I like that. I want the confidence. Okay. So he says verse 7 if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Uh, last week I pointed out to you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, that Greek word chi, uh, the conjunction, in this case, it's an explanatory conjunction as opposed to a connecting conjunction. In other words, it's not two things here where he says, if you abide in me, that's number one, and then number two, and my words abide in you. Now, when he says, my words abide in you, because of this explanatory conjunction in Greek between the two phrases, we understand that his words abiding in me is what it means to abide in him, right? Uh, yes? No? Maybe so? Is what it is means to abide in him. So his words have got to abide in me. I took you over to Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not sometimes, but richly. Deeply, thickly, in a concentrated manner, he says. This is just review. And he says, if that is the case, then prayer initiative and confidence in prayer. He says, middle of seven. Ask what you wish or what you desire, Thalo, and it will be done for you. Why is that? Because all of my requests are being formed and framed by the word that is abiding in me. His word abiding in me. So I'm not going to pray wrong. I don't have to worry about it. I already know if somebody comes up to me and says, you know, ask me to pray for something that is contrary to Scripture, I can't pray for that. I won't ask for that. See, they may not realize that it's not contrary to Scripture, but I do, and I have to know that it is either in line or not in line with Scripture. You know, at the, at the same time, I'm not going to ask for something that I know is outside of God's will for me. If it's feeding my flesh and feeding my personal desires, you know, who wouldn't like a million bucks? I would not like a million bucks. What a pain in the rear. Don't want it. I'll give mine to you. I, mean, I might keep a little. <laughs> I'll probably keep a little because Carrie and I have talked about, you know, plans and we need cash. Uh, but I don't want the whole thing. I really don't. But let's say I did. <laughs> and I'm going, God, you know, you said I could have whatever I wanted. A million bucks would go really great with my new house in Beverly Hills. I'm not even about to ask for something like that. That is the stupidest, dumbest thing. But there are people out there who don't realize how stupid that is to ask for something. They think, they don't, they think that that's something that's due to them. That is, that is coming to them. That's due to them. See? And there's a whole bunch of churches, a whole lot of people out there, you know, that like hearing that kind of thing because it ministers to their flesh that God wants me to have X, Y, and Z. No. God wants me to be conformed to the image of Christ. And Jesus turned to the man that said he would follow him, and he says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I don't have a house. You know, there's an idiot teaching out there. It's got Jesus out there in designer clothes. What are you talking about? Designer robes, you mean? Yeah, designer robes that he had this house in Capernaum. You know, I mean, we're talking about we're talking about a gun, fully loaded, put to someone's head, is what we're talking about here. In every conceivable way. I got a guy, I, I, you know, I'm watching The Five on Fox today, and uh, Bob, Bob Beckel, Democratic, liberal, <laughs> this kind of a thing, and, and, but they all like Jesus on that panel. Not a one of them are regenerate. That doesn't make them bad people. They're just, they're unregenerate. So they're, here, here's what the Bible says about them. They're haters of God. They're enemies of God. Unless you're born again, you're a God hater. That's Romans 5. You're an enemy of God, if, unless you're born again. Because you've got to be made justified by faith just before God and have Christ's righteousness credited to you. That's what imputed it is, right? In order for you to be acceptable and embraced by God. But these people are in the cast of characters that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7. Because on that day, Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, 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 Lord. 
Well, wait a minute. What do you mean? What do you mean we're not getting in? Didn't we do many mighty miracles in your name? Cast out demons in your name? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Because every person born in Adam is a specialized worker in iniquity. In the womb, a worker of iniquity. Everyone. And so a worker of iniquity is going to talk about this guy. He talks about the Lord Jesus, uses his name, you know, and at the same time turns around and calls a guy an SOB on the air today. By their fruits, you will know them. There has to, look, if you're born again and he is your Lord, then according to verse 15, uh, 16, he says, if you have been elected by me, then I've appointed you to go and bear fruit. And that that fruit would remain. Part of that fruit is asking, verse 7, what you will, because what you will will be in accordance with his word, and it will be done for you. You should never be afraid of making a discernment, making a discerning statement concerning a judgment that the Bible instructs us to make about other people's particular place in regards to the schema of God's salvation. Now, you don't want to say that that person's bound for hell, because the thing is, it's like, well, they might be. You know, but you and I don't know that because, you know, we could have said the same thing about the thief on the cross, right? In his life, if we knew his life prior to that, his parents, we don't know what the deal was with his parents. Maybe his parents were just completely, are you kidding me? I'm so ashamed of this kid. And now look, he's being put to death, you know, and they, I knew his life would go this way. It just looked like it. But on the cross, God regenerated him, turned to Jesus, said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But Jesus is right there on the cross dying next to him. He went, what kingdom? What future? No, but you see, faith was given to him. And so Jesus stops, turns to the guy. I love that. Jesus is never, too, he's dying, but he's not too busy for this guy. This day, he gives him assurance. He's done nothing. He says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't gotten, you know, water dunked. He hasn't got sprinkle baptized. He hasn't had his first communion. He hasn't had a chance to do anything, not a thing. And Jesus gives him the assurance that he would be with him because God had elected him and appointed him to go and bear much fruit. And, you know, he did bear fruit on the cross. You know what his fruit was? Confessing Christ. Confessing Christ that he would be alive, that Christ would live and he would have a kingdom. He was confessing the resurrection. I'm not saying he knew it and understood it all intellectually, but I'm saying that's where he was at relative to the faith. And there was the fruit at that moment. There it was. If you abide in me, Jesus said, you abide in me like the good branch is supposed to abide in the vine. You can ask whatever you will. However, if you don't abide in me, you're thrown away as a branch and dried up. Don't do that. Abide in him, which he tells us abiding in him is his words abiding in us. Now we move into tonight and finish this off. The last three points on your, on your outline right there on a fruitless Christianity is a rootless Christianity. This is part three. And now we look at verse eight under the heading of point three on your outline, the conclusion of a Christianity of discipleship, which will lead us to, fourthly, the commandment-keeping Christian that is loved. We'll explain what Jesus says about that. And then five, the Christianity of full joy. So let's read the text from verse 8 all the way down to verse 11. He continues to say, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I mean, there's so much right there. We have a tendency, you know, sometimes words get a little cluttered up for us. Maybe we trip around a little bit. We don't always catch everything. It's always good to read and reread texts, read them over again. You know, when you're at home and you're doing your own personal Bible study and time with the Lord, just read it again. You're not sure what it means. Just read it again. Read it again. You know, you're asking the Lord, give me understanding. The Holy Spirit is here to give me understanding. He's my teacher. 1 John 2.20, right? 1 John 2.27, 1 Corinthians 
2.12, you know, the Holy Spirit is there to do that, and read it again. And the lights will start to come on. Because, you know, I'm not always around to give you the, the word by word comparison thing. But then the things that I have given you will start to rise up. The Lord will bless that. If I have correctly enunciated the teaching of the scripture, the Lord will raise that up in you too. So don't be discouraged when things seem to go by a little fast and maybe you come away and you're not sure what it was that you read or, or studied. Just plan on tackling it again the next day. Just get at it the next day. So let's consider this. Point three on your outline. What is this conclusion of a Christianity which is discipleship? Verse eight, Jesus says to them, Now my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. Za. Uh, notice how Jesus is constantly concerned with who being glorified. The Father being glorified. I mean, that's, a, that's one of those side subjects that's throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus is always looking to the Father. He's always saying that he submitted himself to the Father and that the Father is to be glorified in all things. I do all things, he says in the 8th chapter, to please my Father. That's what he's concerned with. When Jesus uh, receives of the Holy Spirit, empowered for ministry, after he is uh, uh, ritually washed, mikvah style, um, according to the book of Exodus and the high priest that began his ministry with a full washing. And as his cousin John does that for him at the Jordan River, and then he's coming out of the river and the Holy Spirit comes upon him and all three members of the Godhead are present at that moment. Jesus is there. Here comes the Holy Spirit who lights upon him like a dove and then there's this voice from heaven and the voice is the Father and he says, this is my beloved Son. Remember we looked at that for a hot second on Sunday? This is my beloved Son. In Matthew the 17th chapter on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus gets that word from the Father in front of the boys. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. With the caveat, listen to him given. This is my beloved Son. And so Jesus turns, knowing that the Father is listening. My Father is glorified in this. Here it comes. How do I glorify the Father? I'm saved. What's my number one focus? To glorify the Father. To glorify the Father. What's Mr. Catechism? And the answer to the first question is to glorify the Father and enjoy Him forever. I'm sorry. Nothing. To glorify Him forever. So my Father is glorified by this, colon, that you bear much fruit, that you fereo, to wear as clothing, to carry on your back, bearing it, so that others see it. See, it's a Matthew 5.16 scenario, which says what? That's right. Let your light so shine before men that he may see your good works. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light so shine. So wear it. Wear it. So that men see your good works. Now that's you're wearing it. It's out front. You're not covering it. You're not hiding it. And the Father is glorified. Other people feel ashamed by this kind of thing. Oh, I'm going to stand out. I don't want to stand out. I don't want other people looking at me. But God made you and saved you to be stared at, to be looked at, to be seen as the invitation into the kingdom by the Father via the Son. So he says, my Father is glorifying this, that you bear much fruit. And phereo is a present tense form of the verb. And so you have static, present, ongoing action, that you always bear much fruit, that you continuously bear much fruit. Not, not inconsistently, not part-time fruit bearing. I'm part-time Christian because I can't quite, you know, afford to be a, a full-time Christian because I'm not quite there, but I don't mind being a part-time Christian. Yeah, the, the lake of fire will be loaded with part-time Christians. Loaded with them. Notice Jesus' emphasis elsewhere in Mark the fourth chapter. Mark the fourth chapter concerning fruit bearing that is expected and is part and parcel of salvation. He says in Mark the fourth chapter verses 18 through 20 as he's explaining the parable of the sower to the boys. And he says, 
and others are ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who heard the word. Okay, remember, the four types of soil represent four kinds of people. Four types of people. And there's only one soil that is represented as a soil that was transformed, that was made able to take the seed of the word, which is as the sower goes out, he sows the word in the seed. And the soil is enabled, is transformed and made to be able to receive the seed of the word. That then bears fruit. Now watch what it says here. We're talking about the third kind of soil here. And others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. Lots of people hear the word. Lots of people have heard, but so what? Unless God makes it something that is able to be taken in. And you know, a good, good thing to write down right there in your margin, you probably know what I'm going to do, is John 6, 44 and 45. John 6, 44, 45. A lot of people hear the word, but here's what needs to happen. Jesus said, John 6, 44, 45, No one could come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Well, how do you get drawn? 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. There's the drawing. No word, no teaching of the word, no drawing. They should all be taught of God, Jesus says. Everyone who has heard and learned from me comes to me. Not just heard, but learn. But they have to be taught of God. Not taught by men. If God doesn't do it, there is no saving. There is no salvation. So you look back at Mark chapter 4. These ones who are sown among the thorns, that's the type of person that it is. These are the ones who have heard the word, but what does the thorns do? Worries of the world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things, enter in and choke the word, and it becomes what? Yeah, unfruitful. And those are the ones, now he's on the fourth type of soil, this is the good soil, and those are the ones on whom seed was sown on good soil, and they hear the word, accept it. The Greek word means to welcome it. You have to be made to welcome it. And bear fruit. And then he even gives amounts, 30, 60, 100-fold. Now, you can understand that 30, 60, and 100-fold as progress of greater holiness, fruit-bearing, Christ-likeness in your life over a lifetime, or you can understand it as some individuals bear 60. Some bear 30. Some bear 100 over their lifetime, depending upon how long they've been a believer relative to the amount of years that they have left in regards to that. But there will always be some fruit bearing. There always will be. See, A person that calls themselves a Christian and is able to comfortably, comfortably live within the fallen anti-God system who is able to, you know, yeah, I know that guy, you know, he... Uh, he takes the Lord's name in vain a lot. I wish he wouldn't do that. Really? That's as far as it's going to go with you? Really? You're not, you don't feel bound to say something to him? Regardless of the outcome, we're so busy thinking about ourselves. Regardless of the outcome. And we always think the worst. Nine times out of ten, nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing's going to happen to you. It could. But if you're able to be all nice and comfortable in regards to living within something like that, there's a problem. Where is the fruit bearing? Where is the resistance? He says, my father, back in chapter 15, verse 8, is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so, bottom of 8, 15, 8 of John, and so prove to be my disciples. Now, ginomai is the Greek word from which they have they have translated prove, ginomai. Um, it's not necessarily wrong. Usually the word ginomai has the idea of something that uh, b becomes as a result of something else. Coming, becoming in contact. You know, if I, um, if I had a white shirt on and you spilled black ink on me, <laughs> the shirt has become black where you spilled the ink because it's come in contact with the ink. Okay, ink. Uh, it becomes as a result of the contact. Well, here he says, if you're bearing much fruit, then you become my disciples. I think that's better. Prove to be, the words to be, not necessarily, is a little bit of a, 
little bit of a, a inventiveness there in regards to the translation. But it's the idea of you become my disciple. Now, I want you to see something here. That the fruit bearing means, and there's an expectation of fruit bearing, that as you are bearing fruit, you are becoming a what? A believer? No, that's already happened. Jesus, in other words, what's this idea of, where did this idea come from that you can be a believer, but not all believers are disciples? Let me tell you something. A believer that says they don't need to be a disciple is not a believer because that's one of the fruits of God's spirit. He leads you into discipleship. A disciple is a learning one. That's what the word disciple means. To be a, a learned one or one who is in the process of learning, depending upon the form right here. So he says, as you bear fruit, you are becoming one of my disciples. So this is this conclusion of a Christianity that points us to discipleship. One level of learning leads to another level. That's fruit bearing and that desire to learn more. This is what concerns me. So it concerns me about all Christians, but in particular concerns me about folks in our body. Where is the hunger? Where is the desire? Why are not all the chairs filled on Wednesday nights? Why? Why isn't that everybody here for first service on Sunday? Why? Because people, they're not interested. We always do the things we want to do. Don't we? We always make sure we do the things we want to do. It's as simple as that. Well, there might be a circumstance. Well, you know, I used to say that quite a bit. Since then, I have learned about different people's situations. And... Um, you know, I didn't want to come tonight. I didn't. Because I don't feel good. Oh. Oh, pastor doesn't feel good. Mm. I didn't want to come. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to call up Tony and, 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 and Brian right now. I said, one of you guys are going to have to handle it. Because, uh, see, I don't like doing that unless it's absolutely necessary. And it's been necessary. This last year, it's been necessary a little bit, you know. When you get your chest pulled open, you can talk to me about it. But, but in the meantime, it's like, you know, I understand. And I, I started thinking, you know, but you just, you do what you want to do. Now, I'm okay. There's no reason for me to not be here. No reason for me to not be here. You know, because I've had a bad day. So what? Um, most all of you have worked a job all day and you're here. How am I supposed to compete with that when I'm going, well, I just don't feel like coming tonight. You know, pastor doesn't feel like coming. But Paul told me to follow him like he follows Christ. And then Hebrews 13, verse 7 and 17, tells all of you to follow those who have the rule and authority over you, who teach you the word of God. Follow them who have the rule over you, who have taught you the word of God. So there's the example aspect. It's part of being a disciple. We, 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 you know, uh, um, we have to reach a point where we say, thus far and no farther. First Peter 2, verse 1, verse 2, desire what? The sincere milk of the word that you might grow. Desire it. Well, I don't really feel like it. Do you know how to desire the word? Desiring the word is, is, is uh, attained by this. Okay, I'm in a position where I don't really want to read the word right now. So I know what the word says. I'm going against my flesh right now because no matter what I feel, spirituality has nothing to do with you feeling spiritual. It has nothing to do with you and I feeling spiritual. It has everything to do with obedience and discipleship. You think Jesus felt spiritual going to the cross? Was that a, just something that really ministered to him kind of a thing? Here's how you do it. You take out your butt. You don't feel like, you don't want it, you don't desire it right now, but you get it out and you start getting at it. What was Pastor talking about last Sunday? I'm going to go over that kind of a, and just start reading through the text. Oh, I got some notes from last Sunday. Start going through that. And I'm telling you, you turn to the Lord and you ask him to make you hungry, thirsty, desirous for the things of him, that you put him first. You will find that that TV will stay off and all of your little side projects that get in the way, all your little relationships that suck away at the life of Christ 
in your life, start to get into a second, third, fourth, and fifth place in your life. I'm not saying throw your life away. I'm saying get your life in biblical order. Christians are too busy waiting for God to do something. He's already told you. He's already done it. He saved you by grace. He's given you the faith for salvation. He's given you repentance. He's already done it. He's given you and preserved the word. Incredible. And now he says, eat it, drink it, take it in. Right here. We just got through reading it. Well, we're going we're gonna to see it some more uh, tonight. If, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words, that is, my words abide in you. He's going to reintroduce that tonight. And so you start getting into it. And you start going over it and over it and over it. And that hunger will start to build. And it will start to create a thirst that's hard to quench. Man, the TV doesn't quench it. Sports don't quench it, you know. Um, my, my favorite restaurant food doesn't quench it. You know, there is the need and the desire for me to be in the word. And thy word is like a fire, Jeremiah says, that's just shut up in my bones and it's got to come out. And it's a fire that burns from inside out. And other people get to see it. That's what needs to happen. That's what needs to happen in our church. That's what needs to happen. We need to start praying about that. You need to join me. Join with me praying for the folks in our church. It's an issue. It's an issue. I'm getting tired of it. Do, do, you, you feeling it with me? I'm getting a little bit. That's enough of that. Know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Honestly. Honestly. Sometimes I say to Carrie, I don't, I don't know. What do I got to do? What do I have to do? Where is the hunger? Where's the hunger? Where's the See, I, I feel like I pastor two churches. I pastor Wednesday night people, because Wednesday night people are the ones that are here on Tuesday or on Sunday mornings. And then I pastor everybody else that comes for the second service on Sundays. That's that's where it's at. I don't like it. I don't like it. I've been here for too long to enjoy something like that. Yeah, I do. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can get on my bad side all you want. That's perfectly fine. Um, but I'm going to stay at it. I'm going to stay at it. So come with me, please. Come with me. Because like I've said to you before, man, the Wednesday night people, the Wednesday night people, here every Wednesday. See, that's what keeps me going. Because I know, I know who I'm preparing for. I know who I'm cooking for. I know the faces. I told you this once before. I see the faces. I see your faces when I'm doing this. You become one of my disciples, verse 8 is saying, when you bear much fruit continuously, you're being brought into continuous abiding discipleship. And that's what it's about. You know, Jesus said, any man that puts his hands at the end of Luke chapter 9, any man that puts his hands to the plow, and then what? See, I know you know that because you're here on Wednesday nights. And turns back like, you know, is not fit for the kingdom, has not been made ready for the kingdom. A guy who's plowing in the first century and he's looking everywhere except in front of him is not plowing straight furrows. So he's, he's using up the field. He can't get as much productivity out of the field besides the fact that his field and his planting looks like a moron's been dealing with it. But he's, he's, when you're doing this back and forth, you're using up precious space. But if you keep your furrows nice and tight and straight, you can get more seed in, more seed. That's a bigger harvest, see? So the guy's concentrating on getting as much harvest as he can out of the word that he's planting in his own life, in his wife's life, in his children's life, in his friend's life, in his co-worker's life, people in his church and their life. So he's looking straight ahead. But if a guy is too busy being distracted, looking around at other things, he starts doing this. Because he's got to keep the ox going straight. Jesus says he's not fit for the kingdom. You're not ready for the kingdom. And I fear for people like that because they come in, they sit under a ministry like this, and what is going on? The word is just bouncing off of them. Boink, 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 boink. It's just bouncing off. I can tell when it's taken root because those people who I've always said it, for years I've said it, and I still believe it, if you want to be here, you'll be here. 
You know, there's some people that used to attend our church. I've stopped going after them. I've stopped. I'm done. I'm so cooked. Stick a fork in me. Right? I've stopped. Because you know what? There's got to be a stopping point. <laughs> if you want to be here, you will. And you know what? I don't want somebody here who's here with an attitude. I don't want that. How did I end up getting into this tonight, brother? I don't want somebody who's like all tooting out, you know, well, you know, pastor's mad, you know, I guess we better go. No, stay home. As a matter of fact, go to a different church. It's kind of a small church. You probably shouldn't be saying something like that. Ah. God out of these stones can raise up people. He can fill this thing next Sunday, no problem, not a sweat. Not even thinking twice about it. See what happens when I don't feel good and I come to church? <laughs> yep, let's move on to verse 9. And the fourth point, the commandment-keeping Christian that is loved. Verse 9, he goes on to say, just as the Father has loved me. So it's a comparison's coming up, right? Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Wow! How, how deep do you believe, do you think, the Father's love for the Son could possibly be? How complete, how perfect is the love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The love between the members of the Godhead. Absolutely complete, perfect, uh, uh, totally needing nothing. Nothing. In fact, that's the essence of the meaning of, uh, of I am in Hebrew. I mean, it's a completed, needing nothing, complete within himself kind of a thing. I am. <laughs> and he says, just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. So this eternal, incredible love, this love of perfection, without sin, without, you know, without question, without hesitation, compacted, sublime, perfect. I, I'm running out of words. It's transferred, Jesus says, from, that, from the, the Godhead and is put into my relationship with him. And Jesus says, I love you, Kelly. And that same love I, that the Father has for me, I am now sharing that same perfect, without hesitation, love with you. I, I don't know. I don't know. There isn't a commentary in the world that does justice to this. But he says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. And then there's this thing at the end of verse 9. As a, in light of that, abide in my love. And if we didn't have verse 10, we'd be stuck. Um, and I hate guessing, right? I hate guessing the meaning of passages. How do I abide in Christ's love, that perfect love? How do I live in it? Verse 10. It, ah, baby. If you keep my commandments, you will what? Abide in my love. Oh! If I keep his entholos in Greek. Can be translated as uh, commandments. That's okay. Can also be translated as instructions. It's important. Jesus says, You keep my instructions. Keep tereo. Guard, guard time, guard duty. Mount that place. Start walking your, your, your area of guarding, keeping the word in, keeping it from uh, getting out and being exposed and changed, keeping others that are not supposed to have it from invading it and getting into it. See, this is all about. Tereo, guarding, keeping. So yeah, it means to believe it. Yeah, it means to teach it. Yeah, it means to express it. Yeah, it means to do it. Sure, tereo. But this is idea of protection that is so not foreign to this word. So if you tereo my instructions, you'll abide in my love. Well, what are his instructions? See, whenever we see the word commandment, what do we think of? <laughs> Yeah, we think of the Ten Commandments. I have to have a drink. Oh. Hi, I'm back. 
<laughs> Whenever we see the word commandment, what do we think of? We think of the Ten Commandments, okay? That's a problem because we've got to watch our context here. Jesus never calls us to, to be uh, Ten Commandment keepers because he didn't come to um, save us to keep the Ten Commandments. He came and kept the Ten Commandments himself and then fulfilled them. Somebody give me a text. He came to, to, to keep the Ten Commandments himself to fulfill them, and having fulfilled them, now we're in Christ, and we live in God's perfection and His total love because of His substitutionary fulfillment. It's not about me turning around now, and now I'm, I'm, I'm all ready to keep all Ten Commandments. Well, you will never keep these Ten Commandments. And besides, it's never limited to Ten Commandments. There's over 600 of them. 600 plus commandments. You'll never keep them. Okay, now give me the text. Matthew. I, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of remember where it is? Close. Five. 517. 517 and 18, that's, that's part of it too. All right, 517. Don't think that I came to destroy the law. That's, there's your commands. And the prophets, commands in there too. I did not come to destroy, but to, hello? Fulfill them. Oh, not destroy them, but fulfill them. And I say unto you, until heaven and earth, that's the old covenant, passes away, not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass, till all be fulfilled. And then you cross-reference that with Luke 24, what? Close, 44. Luke 24, 44. Cross-reference that, Luke 24, 44. It's the day of Christ's resurrection. He appears before the boys. He comes into the upper room. Shalom, they freak out. He, sa he says, I have fulfilled all that was written about me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. But before he says that, he says to them, this is what I spoke to you before. And he's referring back to Matthew 5, 17 and 18. So when he says here, if you keep my commandments, my instructions, it's not the commandments and instructions about falling under some new, nouveau, neo, um, new revision of Mosaic stricture. It's not about that. It's about all of the commandments that he gives relative to walking in his provided state of substitution for you. Now you're new. Now you're new. See, well, what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was to show us how crummy sinners we were. Right? Got to review. I hear it and see it. Romans, the third chapter. Just write them down. Romans 3.20. Romans 3.20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Whose sin? My sin. As soon as I come in contact with it, it amplifies. It's got this giant spotlight. Sin, sin, sin. That's you, Burks. 4.15, Romans 4.15. What is the law supposed to do? Heal me? Fix me? Make me righteous? No. For the law brings about wrath. Where there is no law, there is no violation. What he means by that is, is that, is that uh, if somebody has no contact with the Mosaic legislation of law keeping, then it cannot be said that they are violators of the law. It doesn't mean that they're not sinners. <laughs> they are sinners. They just don't have the intellectual capacity that is given them to know that they're law violators, lawbreakers. That, that's all that that, that means. Uh, Give me another one, give me another one. How about Romans 5.20? Romans 5.20, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. See, <laughs> the law cannot undo grace. The law doesn't drown grace. Grace has it over law every time. But the, sin, the law came in so that the transgression, your transgression, mine, would increase, make it worse and worse and worse. So many 
places in the seventh chapter of Romans that speak about the same thing. Just felt like you should have that real quick. So Jesus says in 1510, if you keep my instructions, then you will abide in my love. That's how it happens. When he says at the bottom of verse 9, abide in my love, how do I do that? By keeping his instructions or his word, guarding it, knowing it. You can't guard something you don't know. Can't guard something you don't know. Verse 10, middle of it, just as, another comparison, just as I have kept, guarded, my Father's commandments. Ah, see, Jesus, as the perfect God-man who didn't have an Adamic sin nature, that's what the virgin uh, conception was all about, he's the only person in the entire history of the world that could ever keep all of the laws perfectly. He even challenged the Jewish leadership. You know, we've already seen it to some degree. Um, it, which one of you can condemn me for violating the law? To tell me which one. You know, he challenges them in that regard. Well, then, of course, none of them could. And you know it freaked him out because he never, he never offered any sacrifice. He didn't need to. He didn't offer any personal sacrifice, no blood sacrifice, nothing. I mean, he kept the feast days and things like that, but he didn't, he didn't get in any of the bloodletting because that would incriminate him as being a sinner. Well, that would be him lying. If he slit one throat, that means that Jesus was a liar. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So there's a comparison between the two. I abide in the love of Christ, this incredible love, the, the same love as he and the Father shared together in verse 9. And then if I abide and keep his commandments, that I will be abiding in his love. And it's the same way that the Son uh, kept his Father's commandments and on the earth uh, abide, abode in his love. He's just saying, follow me. Do what I do. You can because regeneration enables that. But unless you're born again, unless you're regenerated, and I've, so I've had people say to me, okay, I want that. How do I, how do I get that? I said, I, I can't give it to you. You can't get it for yourself. The fact that you want it probably indicates that it's already happened. On the other hand, you know, you could be, uh, you know, thorny ground. <laughs> the soil, right? Uh, they receive, the, so, the, the seed of the word goes into the thorny ground. And it receives it. It welcomes it, right? Or in the rocky ground that was prior to that. But the sun comes out and it starts to, you know, take hold of the, of the uh, little bit of the seed that sprouted up, dries it up, kills it off because it has no root. You know what that means? Have no root. It means you have no election. Root. A fruitless Christianity is a rootless Christianity. Fourth and finally, a Christianity of full joy. I'm glad he ended it with this. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Isn't that amazing? Because what's Jesus doing? He's going to suffer. If you knew that all this stuff was going to happen to you, like he knew it was going to happen to him, would you be talking to them all nice and calm about it? You know, like, oh, of course not. But you see, Jesus is in control. Jesus is in control. See, this thing I hate about, uh, one of the many things that God and I despise about the Roman Catholic system, one of the many things I despise about it is Jesus on the cross. Everywhere you go, crucifix with this this guy on the cross. That's not my king. That's not Jesus. That's an image. That's an image that the Bible tells us not to make. And we make it anyway. It's not right. It's wrong. It's completely incorrect. Anybody that's gone through the Roman lashing like Jesus did, his skin was hanging from his body. I mean, he looked worse than the most horrible zombie-type horror film you've ever seen before. Juicy, disgusting, and horrible. With his bones sticking out, things like that, yeah. That's what it costs. That's propitiation. So when we're in the book of Revelation, like we were two Sundays back, and we were in that spot in the fifth chapter, and it says, Behold, I see a lamb uh, in the throne as if it had been slain. That's why I was trying to get across some of that to you. All knifed up, chopped up, bloodied up. 
It had been slain. You think when they slay it, they just, now careful now, just put a little bit of a right here and we'll drain the blood out of the, no, when they slew it, not only was, was there a death kill into the heart, but they disemboweled it. They cut parts out of it. It went in different directions. The skin came off. That went in a different direction. It's all part of the tithe system. And Christians want to tithe today. <laughs> you want to tithe today. The, the tithe system in the Bible is a bloody affair. Oh. <laughs> These things I have spoken unto you so that my joy may be in you. Boy, that, that was a rabbit trail. I never recovered out of that. You know, sometimes I, I, I can recover out of those things and get us back to where we were. I completely lost that one. These things I have spoken unto you, he says. These things I've spoken. Oh, I know what it was now because of knowing where he was going right now. And he's telling him about this stuff. See, if Jesus doesn't speak these things, like he says in verse 11, if he doesn't speak these things, he does it in spoken word so that what may be in them. Verse 11. His joy, my joy. What's, what's the joy of Jesus? That's the joy of the Godhead. That's a joy that none of us have, have. I know I haven't experienced it yet. I want to. Man, if I could just have a taste of that joy. And that means, but, he, but Jesus says, you can have this. Burks, he says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. So it comes through the word. Again, I want what Jesus has to give. Spoken unto you through the word, then my joy. You know, you know what's happening here? Uh, you, you've come in contact with that joy, and you like it, and it's infected you to a certain degree because you keep showing up. See my point? My point about our folks, that, that, that they make it a habit. It is their habit. It is their habit, and it is their normal week-by-week -week scheduling that is lacking in the joy of Christ. We need to help them. We need to help them. <laughs> uh, they're not listening to me. Maybe they'll listen to you. It's true, isn't it? They're not listening to me. He says, these things I spoke to you, so that my joy may be in you. Um, take a look at John 17. This is the, the prayer that Jesus is going to pray before they get to Gethsemane. John 17, look at verses 13 and 14. John 17, verses 13 and 14. He's praying to the Father. Now watch this. But now I come to you, he says to the Father, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy full in themselves. And I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. See, anybody that has the real word of Christ, and it's verse by verse, and it's doctrine, and it's exactly what it means by what it says, then the world will hate you for it. The world wants nothing to do with you. The world wants, this is ridiculous Governor Cuomo, are you kidding me? Talk about a guy that needs to be taken out and slapped till his skin falls off, and then Jesus can come and heal him. Who wants to go slap Governor Cuomo? Yeah, well, my wife goes. She's got her hand up. She, you guys are afraid. She'll go. <laughs> and he says, and he says, yeah, you know, who are these? Who, who are these right wing people? He didn't say conservatives. Who are these right wing? Per you know, are they? Are they? Uh, Anti-pro-life, which is just a phrase that was used to take the sting out of the fact that women are killing babies in the womb. Okay, but it's uh, you know, pro-choice kind of a thing. Are they, are they anti-pro-choice? That's what I should have said. Are they anti-pro-choice? Uh, are they, uh, what do you say? Uh, yeah, are they anti-gay? And uh, are, are they for having, what kind of guns? Assault weapons, assault weapons, you know? Well, you, we don't want you in New York. You, we don't want those kind of people in New York. <laughs> Dope. You know, there's a lot of conservative people in the state of New York. Anyway, he's backed out from all that kind of stuff. But the fact that a, an elected official at this time in United States history would say something like that really speaks to the spiritual nature of our country. 
that an elected official who knows that his words are going to go out and are going to be picked up by major and minor news broadcasts would say something like that and feel like he could get away with it. It's crazy. It's insane. It speaks directly to our lack of true spirituality. We have fallen so far from where you know, from where the, the Plymouth Pan Plantation and the Plymouth Brethren relative to the ships and the, the Calvinists that came over here from England and from Holland and from New Zealand. <laughs> we have fallen so far away from our forebears who got down on their knees continuously, regularly, as they came to these shores and committed this land unto Christ Jesus and his gospel. And there was a covenant formed at that moment. It's no joke. We, we've screwed things up faster than any, any other country in history, probably. We've screwed up. It's been 200 years. We're already screwed. 200 years. You know why? Because the church isn't doing its job. Then we've got Washington and Colorado saying, oh, yeah, yeah, THC. Yeah, we'll go ahead and legalize it now. Yeah, it's a good thing. Okay, um, again, church isn't doing its job. Uh, you can rationalize, you know, uh, I'm almost done, so I'm going to just take hold of this. Um, you can take something like that and you can say, okay, well, there's medicinal properties, you know, and th there absolutely is. I'm all for it. I got no problem. Got no problem with using that medicinally under the supervision of a doctor, and I don't think that that's a first step in. It doesn't have to be because it, it's a whole nother matter altogether. When you legalize it and you set up shop and now the government is, is taxing it, just like this is the same people that say, just stop making prostitution illegal, legalize it, we'll tax it, we'll make it a part of our industry. And the country will suffer like Sodom and Gomorrah quicker than you can get up the next morning. Ouch. See? And we're the frog in the kettle, you know, and we're being slowly but surely boiled to death, and we don't even know it's being turned up. And then I hear today that now there's a there's a um, something before the Colorado Colorado State Legislature in regards to um, if you go to get a marriage license, that's a joke. <laughs> Did you hear about this? You go to get a marriage license and you have to agree to so many hours of marriage counseling. They don't call it that. They call it something else. But marriage counseling prior to that or they won't give you the license. And the idea is that, and, and, and it's like, well, okay, it's, this is not entirely wrong, but they're saying there are so many divorces and there are so many divorce cases that are, you know, uh, 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 stopping up the court system with all of these different cases and stuff, it's ridiculous. Well, they're right about that. At least they want to do something. But that, the state, that is not the place of the state at all. The state shouldn't even be issuing marriage licenses. Are you crazy? It's not for civil needs. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Shame makes I've heard of that before. <laughs> 14, 17, 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. That's happening over in Colorado and in Washington because we are not doing our job, because we are not letting our light shine, because we don't knock on doors, because we're not proactive. That's why this is happening. Because we want other things instead of the word of the Lord, and the empty chairs prove it. Tell me I'm wrong. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. When Christianity, the true Christ, true biblical Christ, is preached, the world will not embrace it. So a couple nights ago, Robert Jeffries, he is a Baptist minister, some traditional Baptist minister, wrote a book. The End Matters, or what's that thing called? Why the End Matters. Something, yeah. Something along those yeah. lines. Total, 
It's like reading a Schofield reference Bible in regards to so-called end times things. And it's all about it. He's talking to O'Reilly about, you know, the Antichrist is going to be this Antichrist, you know, in seven years and, you know, all this kind of a thing. Everything is wrong. And, and O'Reilly, who is a Roman Catholic, who is unregenerate, is not right with God, but he's a part of this traditionalistic system and he thinks he is. But, but he believes things that are contrary to the scripture. Anyway, so O'Reilly's giving him time. Let me get on. I got facts. I got the truth. Let me get on. I got books. You want somebody that writes a book? I got some books out there. I'll be happy to let you show my book kind of a thing, O'Reilly. But this is just, and the guy is out, and they're, he's just like, yeah, 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 both of them, you know, and it's like, and it's all good, and it's Fox News. That's not a Christian station, you know. Those are not Christian people. It's just conservative politics is all that is, okay? But everything else is dead man walking. And they're all going, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. The world loves its own because it hates the real Christ. Let's start talking about the real Christ. Back to 1511. <laughs> These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. The word is what brings it. And that your joy may be full. I want full joy. I want whatever Jesus is offering, I want it. 329. John 3 and verse 29. John uh, the Baptist is speaking. John the Baptist says concerning Christ, John 329, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. The bride being the church, yes. The bridegroom being Christ. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's John, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, I must decrease. John's ministry is going away. And he is full of joy. He's full of the joy of Christ. This joy of mine has been made full. He's, he, he says, I don't need anymore. I can die happy now. I can die happy now. My joy is being made full. 1624. 1624 of John. 1624, Jesus says to the boys, Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. See, he wants you to have the joy of receiving things from him. And having the knowledge that, yeah, I got this from my father. That's where the joy. It's not the thing that gives you the joy. It's not the thing that you ask for that gives you the joy. It's the one who gives it to you that's bringing you the joy is what he's saying here. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. 1633. 33 of 16. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter 1.8. And we'll be done. James, 1 Peter. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1.8. Probably ought to back it up to 6. Speaking of joy. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8. In this you greatly rejoice. That is, in what I've just said in verses 3, 4, and 5. <laughs> Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Why is that? So that the proof or the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we go. And though you have not seen him, how many people have seen Jesus? How many in here in this room? Who's seen Jesus? Nobody? Come on, come on. Somebody. Good. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. So he's talking to you and me right now, isn't he? And believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. See, you obtain the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your lives, 
because you haven't seen him and you love him. Because you haven't seen him now, but you believe in him. And this belief leads you into a great rejoicing. I like the word rejoice. So word re I like the word rejoice. I like it better than joy. You know why? Because it means to have a thing again. To enjoy it again. Joy again. Joy again, joy again, joy again, rejoice, rejoice with joy inexpressible. See, right there, the joy is inexpressible. It means I can't explain it to you. I can't really tell you so that you understand. It's just full of glory. I don't even understand that, but I want it. See, I'm glad there's things in the Bible like this, which I can't explain. I can't give it to you. I don't know. Something we all get to look forward to. We all get to look forward to experiencing in the heavenly realm with Christ, with the Father, with myriads of angels. Joy inexpressible, full of glory. But if his word abides in me, I can have a foretaste. I can taste it now. His joy. But his joy comes at some heck of a price. Because the world will have nothing to do with you. It really won't. If your life is acceptable to the world, you know, I have people that, that you know, don't want to play with me because of the, the position I take on these things. I open my big fat mouth. See? And I lose friends. It's okay. They weren't my friends then. <laughs> it's okay. It's a joy inexpressible. And so we find out that this Christianity that is, that is a, a fruit-filled Christianity is a Christianity of full joy. And the last thing we want is to have a Christianity that is a rootless Christianity. A fruitless Christianity is a rootless Christianity. We need to help our brothers and sisters. We need to help them in this church. We need to assist them. We need to say, man, if you need a ride, I'll come and get you. I don't know what's wrong. We would like to see you on Wednesdays. You know, better hurry up because pastor's having a fit, and, and we don't want him yelling all the time. <laughs> you know, say something like that. I just told you you could go ahead and say it. I don't, I don't care. You know, Matt, Julie's going to take this back to Matt. She's going, oh, we've got to pray for Burks. He's losing it out there. <laughs> He's losing it out there. Well, Julie knows there's been, you know, this much, you know, on Wednesdays, you know. I have, I was like, pff, lately I've been like, uh, 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 you know, still nothing. Of course, this last Sunday, did you see last Sunday on YouTube head, about headship? I didn't get it yet. You haven't seen it yet? I, it was on Monday before. I didn't, it wasn't posted when I looked on Monday. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's up now. It's up now. Yeah, right. So I did the whole head covering thing, right? I, I know I, I ticked some people off. <laughs> Now, I'm not doing it to get people mad. It's like, you know, <laughs> I told this story. Well, you'll see it. You'll hear it, you know. Yeah, excuse me for a second while I tell Julie. <laughs> okay, we got to stop. Lord, we just give you thanks for all that you've shown us tonight in the word. Praises to you, Lord God, for your patience how you endure, Lord, uh, with us, your people. And we know, Lord God, that it's your heart that goes out to us and to the people at Messiah Church. And so now, Lord God, let there be such a drawing of your spirit, Lord God, where you touch their hearts right where you know they are most vulnerable to draw them, Lord, into the full life of the body here. We ask for you to do that in Jesus' name. And we ask for you, Lord, to help us uh, to be humble, but to be ready always to give an answer to anybody who asks us of this hope that lies within us that we do with humility and reverence. Thank you, Lord. And now for your people tonight, I ask for you to bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. Be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance upon them tonight. Give them peace in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>